Thank you very much. That's a very uh, nice introduction. And I'd like to thank you, Gareth, for bringing me in, reaching out to me. Um, this, this is a set of topics in the uh, series that I'm, I'm very interested in. How do we shape our our character through the interventions that we make. Um, I'd also like to thank the University of, of Würzburg, a place I've never been to, although I've been not far from there. Uh, as I was stationed in uh, Germany many, many years ago when I was uh, a soldier, I was in Fürth, which is you know, a good ways from, from Würzburg, a various kind of a, a large place. But um, yeah, I'm hoping someday uh, COVID passed to, to get over there, and that would be quite, quite fun. So the, the theme of the series is um, really quite, quite a good one. I think it's a very rich and provocative topic that, you know, as you can see by the other people who are in the series, it can be looked at from a number of different perspectives or thinkers or schools of philosophy. And I thought, you know, I would, I would focus in on the Stoics and in particular Epictetus for a few reasons that I'll, I'll get to shortly. But first I'd like to like bring up just one line from his, his works. This is in the Discourses, uh, Book 1, Chapter 15. He tells us that each person's own life, their bios, is the subject matter, the hule, the, the, literally the, the stuff that you work on, of the art of living. And that's, that's really what we're looking at here. How do we, how do we live well, or you might say it in a, another way, how do we move from living in a crappy, deficient way to a way that's, that's less so? So when I proposed this, I thought it would be worthwhile to focus on the Stoic school, um, in part because the Stoics are all about reasons in a number of interconnected manners. I mean, you could call the Stoics rationalists of a sort if you want to. And, um, you know, I'm not going to presume any great um, background on anybody's part with the Stoics or Epictetus in particular, so that there are a few things I'd like to say about them. Another reason I wanted to bring them up is that after largely being ignored or misinterpreted in academic philosophy since roughly the early 19th century, we're talking about Hegel just a little bit before this. Hegel's a great misinterpreter of the Stoics, um, as is Alistair McIntyre, who gets criticized by Anthony Long for precisely that. Uh, but there's been a lot of attention and interest devoted to the Stoics in the last half century in academic uh, fora. And then, you know, in the last two decades, I think you could say, there has been a continually growing contemporary interest in Stoicism in a popular sense. And so it's, it's um, worth figuring out what did they actually think. Why are we focusing on Epictetus in particular? Well, one reason is that he's my favorite Stoic philosopher. So if I'm giving the talk, why not? <laughs> but um, the ways in which he reinterprets Stoicism also fit very nicely with the theme of this talk series. And he's also quite influential on later philosophers, so I think you know that's another good reason to talk about him. So my, my plan is to you know say a few general things about the Stoic school, some of the distinctive aspects of their, their viewpoints and uh, talk about the importance of the rational or ruling part in their anthropology. And then we'll turn to Epictetus. Um, I call him a conservative Stoic innovator. Um, he's reinterpreting several key ideas that are going to be quite important for us, including that of proiresis. And the bulk of the talk, uh, the idea that I originally pitched to, to Gareth was Epictetus's views on how we structure prior races through practical reasoning as well as through um, its own activity of volition, making some reasons matter more or less for ourselves. So there's a, you know, reason itself, and then there's reasons, and the proiresis plays a really important role in that. And I think that we'll have plenty of time for um, Q&A, which can be, you know, as far ranging as, as you like uh, once we're done. But um, in order to not have our collective eyes all glaze over, I thought we would take a few breaks 
in the course of the talk um, and do some you know Q and A and discussion at particular points, just to make sure everybody's on track and also to, to break it up a little bit um, so that by the end of the talk you're still all you know paying attention and engaged because I've been in many, many academic conferences. I know my own limits when it comes to endurance that way. And so it, it's kind of good to set things up that way. So the Stoic school, right? Who, who are these people? Um, it arises in Athens in roughly the third century BCE. There's this guy Zeno of Kittium, and you might know the story about him having a fortunate shipwreck. He loses all of his uh, investment in royal purple, you know, the, the dye. He literally sees his uh, fortune ebbing away into the the Mediterranean Sea, and then he begins looking for something to do. He goes to a bookseller's stall, he reads a book about Socrates in uh, Xenophon, says, where can I find a guy like this? And the bookseller says, see that guy over there, Krates, go, uh, go talk to him. And so he begins studying with uh, members of three Socratic schools, Crates the Cynic, Polomo the Academic, and Stilpo the Megarian, and he winds up producing a new synthesis of his own, something that is really going to catch on. Um, you know, originally they're just called the Xenonians, but then they get called the people of the Stoa because that's where they would, would gather. And he gathers an entire uh, school to himself. And he, he it, it's oriented around attaining happiness the way a lot of ancient virtue ethics is. Um, he brings in an idea that's not unique to the Stoics, but the Stoics certainly do a lot with living in accordance with nature. Uh, virtue as being the only good, vice as being the only bad, and then other things being indifferent. And one of the handouts that I've, I've you know, provided is about that very topic, the good, the bad, and the indifference in Stoic moral theory, which is kind of distinctive as opposed to, say, Aristotelians or Platonists or you know, definitely Epicureans who would say that pleasure is a good. The Stoics will say pleasure is nice, but it's not a good. Per se, it's an indifferent one that we we prefer, um, but it, no amount of pleasure is actually going to make you happy, um, or or good, or anything like that. Likewise, no amount of pleasure is going to make you bad. Um, so they're they're not anti pleasure or anything like that, as you see with certain of the the cynics, and uh, like a lot of the ancient schools. Um, Stoicism can be understood as what Pierre Addo famously calls a philosophy as a way of life. Um, there's other ways of talking about this. Michel Foucault talks about technologies of the self. Alistair McIntyre talks about tradition constituted rationalities. And Stoicism is one of those. It's something that's not only studied, but but lived. And there's a dialectic between, you know, the, the theory and the practice. You, you can, as Epictetus says, you can read as many books of Chrysippus as you'd like. Now, we can't, of course, because they're all lost, but back in his time you could. Uh, but that's not actually going to transform into action, and you're not fully understanding Chrysippus if you're not um, working you know, through these ideas in your, your ordinary life. And there's a continued development of the school. It's actually, it becomes one of the major schools of antiquity. Um, a lot of cool developments that are happening because they're engaging with the other schools and argument and debate and discussion and every once in a while taking an idea that they like from them, which is uh, you know, pretty par for the course in ancient philosophy. Um, we typically distinguish it into an older Stoa, uh, a middle Stoa, and then a late or Roman Stoa. Um, the old Stoa, Zeno, gets that started, and then there's like a clear line of succession with Cleanthes, Chrysippus, Zeno of Tarsus, Diogenes of Babylon, Antipater of Tarsus, and they don't all get along with each other, or, or they, they do get along, but they don't all agree with each other. There's some famous debates that happen. Uh, for example, Diogenes and Antipater differ on the matter of whether you can effectively price gouge uh, is that okay to do? Is that ethical? Diogenes says yes. Antipater says definitely not. And so there's a lot of interesting back and forth stuff going on. Uh, the Middle Stoa, Panatius, the, the last of the Scholarchs who relocates to, to Rhodes, Posidonius, among others, there tends to be a lot more engagement with the other schools. Um, 
Now, unfortunately, when it comes to what the old and the middle Stoa wrote, we don't have any of their books. We have, at best, um, you know, passages that are being cited or things that are derived from them, that, from them like Panatius is on duties, gets taken by Cicero and becomes the core for Cicero's book on duties. But, but we know that it, Cicero's book goes beyond Panatius's stuff. So it's really with the later Roman Stoa that we have um, literature left. And, you know, as, as happens with philosophical schools over the course of centuries, <clears throat> they're responding to new situations like living in a Roman empire, you know, run by an autocrat like, you know, uh, Caesar, as, as uh, Epictetus will say. Um, you know, they're, they're rethinking the doctrines. There's a continual development that's going on. And, uh, you know, the key people that are associated with that, that we have literature from, would be Seneca, who we have the most of. And then uh, Epictetus would be the second. Uh, Musonius Rufus, Epictetus' teacher, we have some of his stuff. We also have Marcus Aurelius, the uh, uh, Roman em emperor. And we have Heracles, uh, some of his stuff as well, and, and bits and pieces of other things here and there. The Stoic school is going to disappear <clears throat> as an independent school by the Middle Ages, but in part that's because it's, um, it's quite successful in getting some of its ideas adapted by Christian thinkers. Um, and you'll see a lot of references to the Stoics in, say, Boethius or Augustine. Even Thomas Aquinas, who kind of gets them wrong, um, will will talk about the Stoics at different points. Uh, and then in the in the early modern era, we see um, a recovery of texts, and we see uh, a reawakening of interest in Stoicism. So there, there's quite a lot of influence in early modern philosophy and, and in the Renaissance. So what do the Stoics actually think about things? Um, unsurprisingly, like most ancient schools of philosophy, they looked at human beings as being the rational animal, right? So this fits in very well. We, we have reason. We are going to give reasons. And we're, we're not the only rational beings for the ancient Stoics because there's also God with a capital G, you could say, Zeus, who is the whole of the cosmos, right? An idea that most modern Stoics kind of put aside uh, it's, it's a bit implausible in the present. There's also God's lowercase g that we could think of as doing the role of, you know, angels in, uh, uh, you know, like later Christian thought or the daimones in Neoplatonic thought. They're kind of, you know, responsible for getting things done within the cosmos, but they're not, they're not in charge. And the Stoics uh, hold out this prospect of because we're rational animals, we participate within what Epictetus and Seneca will call a commonwealth of human beings and the gods. Um, that's our higher nature. Um, they're also materialists. Um, there's, you know, inert matter. There's uh, pneuma or this, this you know, force that, that connects things together and makes things happen, uh, which can be more or less complexly articulated. And, you know, it can go through a, a number of different stages. If you're familiar with, with Neoplatonic ideas about degrees of being, the Stoics have basically the same thing going on. There's, you know, uh, just bare being, plants who grow, but they're not sentient, animals, and then there's rational beings like us and the gods. They're also, and this may be something that we want to discuss a little bit later on, they're also determinists of a sort. Um, I mean, we would strictly say that they're compatibilists, but their compatibilism is often quite difficult to understand how it's supposed to work. <laughs> we're, we're, again, a bit handicapped by not having Chrysippus to read because he talked quite a bit about this. Um, Epictetus clearly thinks that we have freedom because he talks about it all the time. So, you know, there is a causal determinism, and yet at the same time, we can modify that. We can, we have a little bit of freedom that we can use to, to change the conditions of things. Or another way you can think about it is we can be um, self-causing in certain respects. Or if you like, uh, in older terminology, we can be self-moved movers, but only to a certain degree, right? And um, uh, perhaps more distinctive commitment that's, that's really important here. So, you know, if you know Plato, if you know Aristotle, they have a, a psychology that we call a faculty psychology, 
right? Where um, Plato, you know, for example, has the rational part of the soul, the the appetites, and then this middle part, thumos, and it's difficult to translate effectively the spirited, the passionate, the incandescent part of the soul. But each of these is like a bit that does its own thing, right? And the appetites are like totally irrational. The thumotic part can listen to reason, but it's not truly rational. The rational part is rational. The Stoics see things differently. So the Stoics think that we have basically eight faculties. Um, five of them are the senses, so we can put them aside because all they do is like register information and maybe like seek out information. And then there's the uh, faculty of reproduction, you know, not particularly important for what we're looking at, the faculty of speech. And then there's this eighth faculty that they call the hegemonicon, the ruling part. And this is, you know, what we would call the mind proper. In when you know when Seneca is talking about it, he'll call it the animus in Latin. Um, Epictetus is going to, you might say, widen its scope a little bit. And this is where we find reason or rationality in our other intellectual functions. You know, so it, it's definitely the rational part of the soul. He, uh, well, the Stoics in general say that this is the part that uses and understands what they call appearances or impressions, fantasiae, which we could also translate as imagination. And it's also, this is where it's different than, say, the Aristotelian or the Platonic view, it's also where we feel or think emotions, passions, and affects. So it's all happening in this one place within us. And these include not just the emotions, but also desire and aversion, um, choice and rejection. And this part of the soul is also concerned with ascent, sun katathesis in Greek, and with all the other things that are connected with it. So really everything that's important for our own responses, our, our, our ways of engaging with the world besides the senses and, you know, having sex and saying things, it's all happening in this rational ruling part of the soul for the Stoics. So that is, you know, a significant difference. Um, I do need to say a little bit about Stoic ethics and the philosophy of action that they have. So, you know, like most ancient uh, virtue ethics, there is an overarching end, a telos uh, of goods, and they describe it as uh, happiness or eudaimonia. There's also some other cool formulations like a smooth flow of life, right? Uh, which I guess you could think of as like, things going your way and uh, everything coming together well. Um, they use words like tranquility, you know, ataraxia or apatheia. Um, living in accordance with nature is also a really, really key idea for them, a very complicated idea. And uh, the good for them is essentially virtue and whatever participates in, in virtue. So the virtues and then, you know, good actions, um, good relationships, th those sorts of things. And then the bad is going to be uh, what's opposed to that, vices. And everything else is basically an indifferent. Everything else falls into this, this giant sphere. Some things are totally indifferent, like the number of hairs on your head, whether it's odd or even. Um, one that I always like to bring up with the Stoics that they also thought was indifferent, the color of your skin. Um, they thought that didn't matter for anything, uh, very different than what we see in many parts of the world and uh, uh, our long history, right? Um, but there's also, you know, a lot of things that are, they're not strictly speaking good, they're indifference, but they're, you could, I'm going to play a little bit on words, they're good indifference, they're, they're preferred indifference, right? They have value, axia. And then there's those that have disvalue. So it's not like, being rich is in itself a good thing, and it doesn't make you virtuous, and it, it probably won't make you happy by itself, but wealth is a preferred indifferent, and poverty is a dispreferred indifferent. Um, so Epictetus is inheriting this, this whole schema, you could say. And I do want to say one other thing, and then we'll take a little short, short Q&A break. Um, by the time that we want to study philosophy, or even just think about the good life, we are typically screwed up. 
We've already been damaged, corrupted, gotten things wrong. We've got bad habits, not only of action, but also of mind. We've uh, had all sorts of bad examples provided to us. Our culture has, has imposed all sorts of you know, mistaken notions upon us. And uh, so we need some straightening out. We need some moral development. And um, Epictetus says, and this is in uh, uh, Book 1, Chapter 26 of uh, his Discourses, this is a starting point in philosophy, perception, isthesis, of the state of one's own governing principle. So realizing how screwed up you are, and, and of course you can't realize how, how screwed up you are completely. You, you get to see like surface level things. You're like, oh, I, I get angry too easily. What's going on there? You know, I've been to anger management classes and did some cognitive behavior therapy and I'm still getting angry at people. Well, that's your governing principle that you got to take a look at and see, you know, if, to use one of the metaphors that we have here in the States, you got to look under the hood, right, at the car uh, and see what's, uh, what's wrong. Is it out of oil? Um, is there something burning? <laughs> Pick whatever you like. Now, obviously, we can't work on very modern cars anymore. You've got to take it into the shop because they're far too complicated. But assuming that you could actually do it, um, it, would, it would be, you know, what Epictetus is telling us we need to do. So um, before we jump into Epictetus himself, um, any, any questions so far, things that we need to get clear about or, um, you know, we don't want to go off the, the path too much. Yeah, go, go ahead. Anyone can go off um, mic if you want to and just uh, ask what you want. Or, or you can put it in the chat too. So that's, that's a good question. You could frame it in terms of is um, the capacity for communication part of the way in which we structure our thoughts, right, and, and emotions and things like that? I mean, I think from the present perspective where, you know, we have centuries and centuries of, of realizing that um, communication is connected up with our, our rationality and our emotions and all these things, we would probably say, yeah, there's probably a much closer connection. The ancient Stoics, um, I think what they, and, and we don't really, we don't have any treatises on this, but I think what they mean by the faculty of speech is just the capacity to like articulate. So, um, I mean, you could also say, <laughs> What about reproduction, right? Um, we're sexual beings. Uh, shouldn't this be part of it? I mean, we have a desire for it. And, and the Stoics, I, I don't know exactly why. I mean, the sense is it makes sense why they would put them aside, but why would they consider those two things, speech and reproduction, to be like their own separate faculties? Um, I don't think we have really good explanations for that. I mean, it doesn't play a huge role for Epictetus, as, as we're going to see, he's mostly interested in what we're doing with any of our faculties. Um, and it's all centered on this, this rational ruling part. So that's, that's a, good, a very important question, though, I think, if we're going to try to adapt this to modern times. <clears throat> any other questions? Or Yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is whether there's a connection between this Stoic ideal of living in accordance with nature and then their epistemology, their theory of knowledge. There, I mean, there, there are connections. Um, but again, unfortunately, we're kind of handicapped by mostly learning about this through critics of the Stoics, like um, Cicero in the On Academics and Plutarch in certain respects, and then uh, Sextus Empiricus in particular, right? Because he, he goes after everybody. <clears throat> and the Stoics, um, I mean, they, they were committed to this idea that we could have um, what they called cataleptice fantasiae, that is, impressions that we can't possibly be wrong about, right? And, you know, you could say when that's the case, you're like grasping reality as it truly is before you. Um, they seem to think that this is quite important. Um, you don't see Epictetus particularly worried about this. Um, and even Seneca isn't particularly. So by the time of the Roman Stoa, they're, they're less concerned with this. But you, you get the idea that for the early and the middle Stoa, this is really central. 
Um, the other thing I will say is that <clears throat> this idea of living in accordance with nature, it's, it's a great slogan. Um, Lawrence Becker in A New Stoicism, uh, one of the very important books in the academic revival, actually says, this is a, this is a terrible phrase, we should get rid of it, it's, it's only done harm. <laughs> Right? And it's it's in part because when you look at what the Stoics say about living in accordance with nature, it turns out to be quite complex. And people always want to reduce it down to, well, that just means living rationally or just means living virtuously. But it, it's something that was controversial within the Stoics. Um, you know, uh, Chrysippus, for example, said, listen, it, it, it's not just living in accordance with nature as like the totality of what is and, you know, um, not not being in contradiction with it. It's also living in accordance with human nature. Uh, so, and then you say, well, what you know, people do awful things, right? Uh, human nature seems pretty bad. And he'd say, no, 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 no. We mean a like a fully developed human nature. And then you're like, well, what is that? You know, and and that's where it starts to get more and more complex. And and the Stoics every once in a while will come out of um, left field, so to speak, with some remark about. What's in accordance with nature? You know, Musonius Rufus will tell us that being a farmer is is the job that's most in accordance with nature. You know, and you're like, well, where is this coming from? And how how does this help us, right? And so you've got to piece together this incredibly complex composite picture, I think, in order to get at a lot of what they they mean by it. But yeah, knowledge does play an important role. Um, I don't know that we necessarily need to be absolutely certain about things. In order to be able to run our lives well, you know, that, that's that's the impression I get from Epictetus that we're not going to get to the point of having these like absolutely foundational perceptions about things. We're continually refining our our understanding of things, and so it's more of an approximative thing than like a on-off switch. Um, I see another question from uh, Sonia. A lot of good questions about the emotions. Um, the Stoic idea is that about the emotions is that every one of them does have a cognitive content, which is not unique in in ancient virtue ethics. I mean, Aristotle says that about the emotions too, right? In Rhetoric Book Two, <clears throat> but the Stoics consider every emotion to include not just the affective state, but also some sort of judgments that's being made, typically wrong. <laughs> Because you know they there's this this caricature of the Stoics as being like anti-emotional you know ooh emotions are bad stuff them down that's not quite true, but you can say that they do think a lot of our emotions are intrinsically bad for us so like there's no right amount of anger for the Stoics right but anger is a complex thing that does include judgments that like the judgment that we've been wrong the judgment or the inference that it was it was um, unjust that we were wronged in this way, we should get re revenge or retaliation. There's a whole bunch of moving parts, right? Now about um, the, the thing that you asked about, like are there some that we, we just can't you know, like do anything with, right? So Seneca, <clears throat> interestingly, thinks that once you start feeling a strong passion and you have assented to it, you basically are stuck and you can no longer resist that, you, you're you stuck acting on the basis of that emotion, like anger, for example. Now, Epictetus doesn't really agree with him. Epictetus says you can reason with somebody who is angry. It's just very difficult to do, right? So how much, think of like the ruling part is like being a container. Seneca is saying um, once you've allowed that container to get filled up 51% with anger, um, anger's running the show until till you're no longer angry, right? And um, you know there might be 49% of reason still left in there, but it doesn't matter because whatever is in charge is in charge. Epictetus is a little bit more optimistic on the capacity for us to reason with ourselves or others to reason with us when we're angry or sad or I mean what else? Uh, unduly fearful or um, ashamed or you know things things like that so yeah well let's let's uh, I mean there'll be plenty of time for more questions um, let's talk about Epictetus himself so I, I mentioned I think of him as a conservative stoic innovator 
he's very clearly drawing on and referencing and even using in his own teaching, because he is a teacher, previous Stoic philosophers. Um, he mentions Chrysippus incessantly, as well as his teacher, Musonius Rufus. But he also um, deviates from the other Stoics in some very interesting ways. He discusses the term virtue much, much less. He brings it up only at a few points in the, the discourses, and his teaching about it shows that he like totally understands the Stoic point of view. He's actually got a passage where he's like, anybody can give a discourse about virtue and vice. Um, the real test is whether they can actually put that into practice, and what they do when somebody interrupts them. <laughs> can, they, can they get back on track with it or not? If not, then it was just kind of surface level stuff. He'll talk a lot more about like freedom or tranquility or or interestingly, faithfulness, um, pistis, you know, being trustworthy, uh, a sense of shame or self-respect, eidos. Um, and then he, he's constantly hammering on this in accordance with nature thing. But he's also going to change the way that's framed as well. He introduces um, the, these famous three disciplines that we don't find anywhere else in the Stoics. Um, as a matter of fact, we find three disciplines that are a little bit different in Seneca when he talks about ethics. Um, he focuses very heavily on some things that are more important in other schools of philosophy, like, for example, um, prolapsis, which we translate as uh, preconceptions or general conceptions. That's, that appears to be originally a idea coming from maybe the Epicureans. Um, it's definitely not a uh, primarily Stoic idea. Um, the what's in our control, what's not in our control, that, that people take a lot from Epictetus because it's right there in, you know, Enchiridion 1, the Epphemine and Uc Epphemine, um, that is an Aristotelian term originally, um, as is proeresis. And Epictetus is taking these and he's doing things that are, they're not not Stoic, but they're sort of expanding the scope of, of Stoic philosophy by doing that. And so this, this term proeresis that I, I wanted to concentrate on for this talk, um, it's used by a lot of earlier authors like Demosthenes, Socrates, Plato. Um, it'll get used later by Philo of Alexandria and Plutarch, but it's, it has more importance in the Aristotelian tradition because Aristotle views it as you know, the, the, the part of ourself that like, makes decisions, that engages in, it's often translated as moral choice or deliberative choice. Um, it's not particularly important for the Stoics before Epictetus. It's, it's rendered as choice before a choice, which kind of makes sense, right? Pro before hieresis, uh, choice. And there's no reference whatsoever to it in Musonius Rufus. It's not a term that Cicero notes being used and in need of having a Latin translation. Uh, we don't see it in Heracles. Uh, who might be a contemporary of Epictetus. There's minimal use of it in Marcus Aurelius. So we can say, well, what the hell is it doing there in Epictetus then? Well, it's absolutely central to his, his entire philosophy. You could say that this is one of the main contributions that he is making. And there's a lot of different ways we can translate this. Um, just to give you some of the English translations, faculty of choice, power of choice, moral purpose, disposition, volition. Long will actually translate it occasionally as the self, which I think is understandable, but not completely right. Moral character, moral personality. And then Michael Freda will, will translate it as the will, as have some other people as well. So what, what is this proeresis? If we look to Epictetus, um, there's, there's a number of different characteristics, and I'm just going to mention four of them. One is that it really is the core of who you are. It's the core of the person. Um, he, at, at one point he says, you are proeresis. And that's you know, about as unequivocal as you can get. Um, he also tells us you're not flesh or hair, but proeresis. So if you get that beautiful, then you will be beautiful. So there's an identification of the you, the acting subject with your proeresis. Um, at another point, he says that you're not flesh or bones or sinews, but that which uses them governs and understands appearances. So we're getting, you might see where we're going with this, uh, a little bit of foreshadowing there. Uh, 
It's also the ethical locus. Um, he tells us over and over again, good and evil lie in the prioracis. I mean, it's not as if nothing else is good or evil, but that is the primary location, you could say. And uh, at one point he actually says, and this is uh, in um, book three, chapter 10, outside of prioracis, there is nothing either good or bad. And it kind of makes sense if, you know, virtue and vice are what's really good or bad. Um, the thing that does the choosing, the thing that's uh, shaping itself could, could work that way. Prioracis is also free. It's the locus of our, our freedom. And so he says that nobody is actually master over another person's prioracis unless that person chooses to allow that to happen. So if you, you know, if, if you're looking for my praise and that matters to you, I become your master uh, because uh, you're seeking something that I actually have control over. He um, goes so far as to say that not even Zeus, the God, you know, that, that is the whole universe can hinder my moral purpose, my prioracis. Um, so that's, you know, if Zeus can't, then really nobody can. Um, he tells us that nothing outside of the sphere of prioracis can hamper or injure prioracis. It alone can hamper or injure itself. And that's a very important uh, thing to, to point out because when we talk about like shaping our character and giving reasons, we are the ones typically who screw ourselves up from an from an Epictetian Stoic perspective. Um, the other thing that I think is a really important aspect that we're going to talk quite a bit about is the prioracis. It's, you know, if you think about this choice before a choice, another way of thinking about it is the pro is choosing one thing instead of another thing in place of another thing. Prioritization, we could say, or if you like, preference. Um, you know, sort of like the, the, the German uh, uh, name. Right, is there a phenomenon um, that you see, like in Max Scheler, or, you know, phenomenologists of value, right? You prefer some things over others. The prioracist does that, right? And so we have a lot of examples of having to choose between something that's less valuable and the prioracist itself being a certain way. And this is a choice that you make through the prioracist. So th this shows us it's a pretty powerful faculty. Now, how does this fit in with the ruling faculty or the rational faculty? Some scholars like um, Anthony Long want to say that they're not exactly the same thing, that you can make a distinction between them. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of other uh, traditions in philosophy that say that we have, you know, reason or the rational faculty or the intellect over here, to the cognitive faculty, and then we have the faculty of volition or choice or however you're going to define it over here. And they, you know, they work together a lot of the time, but they're, they're distinct from each other. Um, and you could say, you know, this is cognitive versus affective or volitional. Epictetus uh, talks in such a way as to make it plausible to say that prioracis actually is the rational faculty, actually is the ruling faculty. All three of these are different ways of talking about the same basic thing. And this is, I think, pretty distinctive, not just in um, Stoic philosophy, but in philosophy in, in general. Um, so, you know, why should we, why should we think this is the, the case? There's really three main reasons that I've isolated out and talked about elsewhere that stem from uh, his, his writings themselves and from common features. So when it comes to good and evil, right, he tells us that good and evil reside within the scope of the prioracis. So what about the, the rational and governing faculties? He tells us in uh, book two, chapter eight, what is the true nature of the good? It's intelligence, nous, knowledge, episteme, right reason, orthos, logos, in use and understanding of appearances. Uh, he also tells us the ruling faculty of a bad person is not to be trusted. I mean, because it's, it's their prioracis. And uh, in book three, he tells us the subject matter with which the good and excellent person has to deal with is their own governing faculty. So, you know, if prioracis is where good and evil reside, then it looks like, 
either it's in the, the governing faculty or it just is the governing faculty. Um, there's also a stronger case that's provided by the reflexivity of proiresis and of the rational and ruling faculty. So what, what is reflexivity? <clears throat> it's when something bears upon itself. I mean, a silly instance is the old um, liar's paradox. This sentence is false, right? It's, it's reflexive. It's referring to itself. Um, but when we take a position on our own selves, when we regret something and we're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that to that person, or, oh, I, uh, I did the wrong thing, I made a bad choice, we are reflecting on ourselves, right? And this is part of the nature of being a, a human being but by being a, a rational being. So um, he tells us in book one, chapter one, that the rational faculty is the only one which is self-contemplating, self-approving, or condemning, one that makes use of appearances, fantasiae, one that bears upon other faculties. So if the rational faculty is the only one that does that, and that's also what proiracist does, I think you can see the conclusion. Proiracist is the rational faculty, right? Um, he'll also tell us uh, similarly in Book 1, Chapter 17, nothing is superior to reason and analyzes it because reason uh, analyzes itself. Uh, in two, uh, book two, chapter 23, proiracis is the self-contemplating faculty. Um, and there's a number of other things that could be said similar to that. The whole conformity to nature, being in accordance with nature, um, he constantly talks about keeping proiracis in accordance with nature. He also talks about keeping the ruling faculty in accordance with nature. So if there isn't a complete coincidence between proiracis, rash, the rational faculty, and the ruling faculty, they're pretty close. They're, you could say that they overlap and there's just a tiny little bit of um, non-coincidence between them. Now, there's a really important upshot for this in terms of giving reasons and how we use reasons. In one, a chapter, uh, book one, chapter 28, he says, what is the reason we assent to anything? The fact that it appears to us to be so. This is the nature of the intellect, to agree to what is true, to be dissatisfied with what is false, and to withhold judgment from what is uncertain. So when a person assents to a falsehood, rest assured it's not their wish to assent to it as false. And then he says, in the sphere of actions, what we have corresponding to the, what do we have corresponding to the true and false? Duty and contrary to duty, the useful, the not useful, what is appropriate to me and what is not, and similar things. So we've got like reasoning processes going on over here in the rational faculty, you know, concerned with truth and falsity, and nobody wants to assent to what is false. And then all the other stuff, the action, the choices, the um, affective stuff, there's a similar logic going on, and they, they basically map on to each other for Epictetus. Uh, when he talks about error, he says every error involves a contradiction, a mache in, in Greek, a, a conflict, right? We could translate it as if we don't want contradiction. Who is in error does not wish to err, but to be right, and it's clear they're not doing what they want to do. He says, every rational soul is offended by contradiction, and so that uh, so long as a person doesn't understand that they're involved in contradiction, there's nothing to prevent them from doing contradictory things. But when they've come to understand the contradiction, they have to, of necessity, abandon and avoid it, just as bitter necessity compels a person to renounce the false when they perceive that it's false. But as long as the falsehood doesn't appear, they assent to it as truth. So a person who can show to another the contradiction that causes them to err and can bring home to them how they're not doing what they want to do and is doing what they don't want to do is, as he says, strong in argument, in logo, right, and effective in encouragement, protreptikos, and in refutation, alenticos. These are sort of, you know, kind of common modes of discourse in ancient philosophy. So what is he saying there? He's saying, um, you know, there's like, again, the this cognitive side, you, you don't want to be involved in getting things wrong uh, in terms of your intellect, but in terms of what you're choosing to do, how you're living your life, what you're committing to, it's exactly the same thing. 
And if you want somebody to change it, it you can't just like yell at them or you know punish them. You got to show them how they've got things fundamentally wrong, and then and then they will uh, want to change it. Um, there's a good bit I'm going to skip over a little bit here because I I, I want to be uh, cognizant of, of time here, but how, we can say how does pre-racist actually work on itself, right? So it determines itself, and one way that we don't do it, um, the way that Epictetus thinks about it, is it's not like there's a little tiny person inside of ourself that looks like us, a homunculus, as we call it, and that's the pro-racis. Um, you know, perfectly conscious, arranging, deciding, that's just an imagination that we have. And that's, that's not like what we experience, and that's not what Epictetus tells us. Epictetus tells us instead, what is reason? It is a system, a sustema, a connected network of fantasia, appearances. And we could say the same thing about our prioracis. What is it really? Well, it's a bunch of habits, it's a bunch of desires and aversions, it's a bunch of um, things that we've chosen to do that have had their effects on us. It's also the thing that's doing that stuff. It is us acting on ourselves. And um, we, we, you know, we work on it through how we choose, how we commit to things. Um, he tells us that nothing is capable of hindering pro as we as we talked about it, nothing that lies outside of its sphere, but only itself when it has become perverted or, or gone astray. And through this, it becomes the only vice, the only virtue. It uses all the other faculties, and these are good. They're just not, or important, but they're just not as important as, as pro-racist. And so we can ask, well, how does it how does it fix itself? How does it become more prudent or more rational? And a lot of this is through cognitive means. And this goes right to our theme of reason and reasons, right? So you apply reason through prioracis to bring the governing principle back in line, he tells us in uh, 2.18. This is, this is a, a place where he's talking about all three of these working together. And he says that um, what we have to do is look at our and it's translated in different ways, our dogmata, our judgments, our opinions, the things that we assert, right, or the things that we buy into, um, we need to look at those. We need to be very careful with, with those things. And also our assumptions, our hupoleipses. So we, we work on those and we try to get those better. We try to get them you know, more in accordance with how things actually are, whether um, about intellectual, theoretical matters or about moral matters. And as we do that gradually, we get better and better. And one way we can do this, like he says, is he says, let a person transfer their judgments to matters that lie within the province of proiracis, and I guarantee that they will be steadfast, whatever the state of things may be. This is a constant theme in, in Epictetus. So we have to have you know, like continual attention to these choices that need to be made. This is what he calls prosoche, or paying attention, uh, another important value. And we um, gradually develop a life where we're more conscious of what we're doing with ourselves in relation to all of these things that belong to us, like our desires, our beliefs, our judgments about things, the things that people have told us that we've bought into, uh, as well as the environment that we live in, which includes many other people and um, things that are, that are going on. So this is, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that could be said about the, um, the how we transform pro-racists. But let's take a little pause here, because that's already a lot that I've thrown at you. Uh, answer a few questions. And then we'll talk about um, habituation. I've got one key theme uh, that ties in with how, how this works in, in practice, and then we can explore some other things. Um, OK, so, so she says, how is reason connected with appearances? So appearances are fantasia, this, this um, this term that covers a whole wide range of things. They're not all necessarily external. Um, 
And some of them might be imaginations, some of them might be memories. They, they cover, it's a term that covers a huge scope of things. Epictetus tells us at one point that reason itself, logos, is a system, a sustema, a connected network of, bless you, of appearances. And so there's no like one single thing that is reason. In Epictetus, it, it's it's understood basically as like a whole composite thing that's that's put together, which is kind of good news because it means like there's no node that could be destroyed that would then render us completely reasonless, you know, irrational. But it, it also, if you think about it, it also means that we're never quite done with putting it together. It's not as if we have a faculty of reason that we start out with and it's just perfect and then it gets screwed up we're continually building it. And you can say a similar thing with our, our proiresis. You know, we're continually building it. When we were little kids, uh, some of it was being built by us, but much more was being built by our parents for good or bad or our teachers or you know, whoever else, right? And since proiresis and, and the faculty of reason are sort of like two different ways of looking at the same thing, you could say that proiresis is also a, a sustema, a Net, a network or a, a matrix of, of things. So um, I'm sure there's some other questions as well. Well, Epictetus is a Stoic, and so and he doesn't define freedom either as, as self-causing. That's just um, one aspect of it, you could say. I mean, when we think about this term freedom itself, it's, it's an ambiguous term, right? Um, it, it encompasses a number of different aspects. And um, being able to cause yourself is one, or being able to like determine yourself, we could say as well, is one key part of it. But you're, you're never like totally able to change yourself all at once, are you? I mean, you can, you can sort of like focus on this part as opposed to this part and try to fix this thing over here. But it's, it's sort of like, um, you know, are all of you familiar with whack-a-mole that that game where you try to you have to hit the thing and it pops up and then it pops up in another location so the, the moral progress is kind of like that you're you're continually trying to work on uh, one thing and then another thing pops up over here and you you work on that thing as well but you're free to do that right you and and you can say well how free uh, just a little bit you know we don't have to be totally able to transform ourselves in a moment in order to, to be free. Um, and, and the other interesting aspect of it that constantly comes up in Epictetus, isn't talked about so much by the other Stoics except for Seneca maybe, is that we're, we're usually misusing our, our freedom. Um, this is a, a theme that also comes up with you know later thinkers like Ansel of Canterbury or the existentialists. Um, we can throw our freedom away and become, as Epictetus will say, enslaved to things because that's the opposite for him of freedom. So I can make free choices to um, prioritize some things that I shouldn't prioritize, you know, and that is going to render me over time um, less free, you know, as I develop habits, for example. Um, he thinks that habits are, are incredibly important. So yes, the confusion about the self-causing term arises because you're taking it in too strong of a sense. Um, it's not as if you like will yourself into being metaphysically. That's not what it means at all. Um, it just means that we, we have a capacity to work on ourselves, to determine ourselves. I, I, I think so long as you can keep it at a sort of mundane level, um, it, it doesn't wind up being that confusing. And if, if self-causing winds up... Um, generating confusions, just change it to self-determining, you know, because that's that's basically what they mean by it. So, sure, yeah, I mean, we do this all the time. Um, you know, showing up here to the uh, Zoom session is a case of all of us determining ourselves to do something that we had wanted to do before, and then we follow through on the commitment that we've we've made to it. I mean, we do this constantly. Um, and we often do it wrongly in ways that that allow other things to determine us more. But I, I don't think there's there's much.
tricky or, or, or mysterious about this um, unless we we think like on too grand of a scale, you know, again, we're not, Epictetus doesn't think that we can like transform ourselves in an instant into a wonderful human being, but we, we do have it like each moment that we're doing something, we have some capacity to intervene and choose one thing rather than another or prioritize one thing rather than another. And, and I think this is not, this is not particularly stoic, um, Aristotle says similar things about at least some stuff. Um, it's very common in later uh, Neoplatonic thought and Christian thought to, to say these sorts of things, right? So, sure. I see that Sonia has her, her hand up as well. So the question about reflexivity and putting it into contemporary terms, reflexivity is a contemporary term. I mean, there's an entire tradition called reflexive philosophy that you find that includes like Maurice Blondel and Jacques Pauliard and stuff like that. And is it is it tied in with sort of Frankfurtian higher order, lower order things? I would say that um, you could say that uh, we've got this general category of accounts that think that the human being is in some degree with some faculties reflexive. And Frankfurt's approach to that, which is a very popular one in contemporary philosophy of action and analytic circles, um, is just one of many possible ways of articulating that. Right? Um, I, I think that Frankfurt's account is sometimes helpful in, in some respects, but I don't know that all of this can be understood in terms of higher and lower order desires. You know. Um, in part because it's not just desires, but it's it's volitions and it's you know thoughts about things. Now, um, the other part that you were asking about, you know, like, are we completely conscious about all, all these things, right? So, Epictetus isn't Jean Paul Sartre. Sartre is is kind of famous for very implausibly saying that um, we're we're basically conscious of everything. You know, we, we just kind of hide it from ourselves. And so like, you know, for example, psychoanalysis is is not what it pretends to be because we don't really have hidden desires that have to be brought to, to consciousness. Sartre, I think, overplayed his hand. As Simone de Beauvoir her, herself also like said, yeah, this is this is probably wrong, right? And so, but he represents a certain extreme position that you do see a lot of people saying, well, if you did this thing, you must have been conscious of it. I think we're driven by um, poorly understood desires and, and implicit processes of reasoning all of the time. And Epictetus thinks that too. He thinks that part of what we have to do is bring these things to light, which sometimes we may not ourselves be able to do on our own. We might need somebody else to help us out with it. Like I think Epictetus would say a good psychotherapist would, would function almost like a moral philosopher like he's doing in helping us understand just how screwed up the, the things that we've committed ourselves to are, right? And so um, I don't think that he thinks that we ever have like complete – consciousness of everything that's going on within our, our own psyches, or to use another term that um, Albert Camus loved, uh, lucidity. I don't think he thinks that we have complete lucidity of, of that. But now this is a kind of a, it's actually a great question because, so you can say, well, the, we, we, how, do, how the hell do we know that we're on the right track? You know, we can have more consciousness. Like you do see some people in life and you're like, that person seems totally clueless about what they're doing. You know, they, there's like some surface level thinking going on, and then there's all this other stuff that clearly is happening, but they're not they're not getting. You know, uh, they need they need some real you know uh, examination or, or reflection or pick whatever you want to use. Um, over time, you can become more conscious. Although I think you're, you're probably always kind of a mess. You know as far as Epictetus is concerned, including himself. I mean, he says at one point, eh, I'm never going to be Socrates, but uh, I don't have to be. I could just be a good Epictetus. <laughs> so, uh, Stefan has a, a question as well. So um, the question is, what is the new feature in Epictetus's concept of prioracis in comparison to the older Stoics? Um, 
there's a couple things that you can say. One is that the ancient, the other Stoics didn't pay any attention to prioraces, period. Um, and then you could say, well, yeah, but Seneca and Cicero do talk about um, voluntas and uh, volitiones. And you could say, okay, there's some, some overlap there, right? Um, but it's not voluntas like in the full sense of like Augustinian voluntas, uh, which looks much more like Epictetian prioraces. And Michael Freda is willing to say that Epictetian prioraces simply is the will. Per se, um, I wouldn't go quite so far. I would say that Augustine is still adding, and, uh, and other thinkers are adding a little bit more. But Epictetus is pretty close to the the later ancient concept of, of you know the will. And um, so there's that. And you could also say it's it's also interesting that he takes essentially an Aristotelian term. Aristotle is the you know first great theorist of prioraces, and then has no problem whatsoever using it in whatever way he wants. But it goes beyond Aristotle. For Aristotle, um, if prioracis is self-determining, um, you have to kind of read that in. Um, it's very clear in, in Epictetus that it, it is who you are. It is the core of the person. And no earlier Stoic says that, right? So that's definitely an advance. Um, it's, it's capacity to determine itself freely without anything else hindering it unless it chooses to allow that to happen. I would say that that's something new too. And you know, could you say, well, the, the, the other Stoics didn't have any conception of that? And we don't know because we don't have the writings. I mean, we have summaries of their doctrine in, I would say, Cicero, uh, Arius Didymus, and, and Diogenes Laertes, but um, maybe they didn't pay attention to it, I, I, you know, it's 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 difficult to say with any certainty, right? What we can say is like, holy crap, for this Epictetus guy, he won't he won't shut up about this thing, right? So even if we we're just going to go by some you know lexical thing like word count, it's clearly much more important for him than for any other philosopher before him, uh, and maybe any philosopher after him, you know, because I mean, who who uses Greek to to uh, these days uh, to, to write about it. I will say one other thing too. This is a little bit of a trivia, right? So when philosophy is moving from, from Greek into Latin, um, I think a lot of confusion got generated by the translation. It's not proiracis that gets translated as voluntas. It's um, ulesis, which, which, well, yeah, like rational... Um, desire, right? So we see that in Cicero, we see that in Augustine, we show, see that showing up in Thomas Aquinas when he's like doing his commentary on, Ar on Aristotle. Proiracis gets translated as liberum arbitrum, um, the, you know, which is usually like so, cast as something like, this is what the will does, you know, but it's not the will itself. When I think that Epictetian prioracis really is like the will, just you know maybe there's there's a little bit more added to it um, as as things go on, but it, it's pretty close, you know. So I'm more or less in agreement with with Freda on that, and I, I think Long is actually wrong. I don't think that that um, prioracis, the rational faculty, and the hegemonicon are different in Epictetus. Um, I think they they basically are the same thing. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit. There's one theme that I wanted to bring up, um, and maybe we can come back to the habituation stuff later if people are interested in that. Is an example of like practical reasoning, how we give ourselves reasons about things. If you've read a lot of Epictetus, you know that he he thinks that money doesn't really count for much, but he talks about it a lot. Money, prices, costs, and exchange. And he does so in a number of ways that fit in nicely with this. So I'm just going to read a bunch of, of passages and we can talk about them and comment on them. So in, in uh, book two, chapter 18, he says, once you conceive a desire for money, if reason be applied to um, your, you know, to your, your own perception of the evil, the passion is still, so our, our affect is, is changed, and the ruling part is restored to its original authority. 
But if you don't apply a remedy, your governing principle doesn't return to its previous condition, but upon being aroused again by the corresponding appearances, it goes right back into the desires even more quickly. And if this happens over and over again, the next stage is that a callousness results and the infirmity strengthens the avarice. So in this passage, we see virtue or vice, um, applying reasons, uh, the ruling part, and the choice to do so, all connected together um, in, in a way that's pretty typical of Epictetus. In uh, Book 1, Chapter 7, he says, what is the professed object of reasoning to state the true, to eliminate the false, to suspend judgment in doubtful cases? Is it enough to learn this alone? And he says, well, is it enough for the person who wants to make no mistake in the use of money to be told the reason why you, don't, why you accept genuine drachmas and reject the counterfeit? What do you need to add to this? A faculty that actually tests the genuine drachmas and the counterfeit and distinguishes between them. So there's, there's a similarity to handling currency and accepting it to how we, we reason about things. And... Um, in chapter uh, three of book two, he's talking about Diogenes. Um, some of you may, you know, be familiar with this this practice. You're asked to write a letter of recommendation for somebody, and Diogenes says, "I'm not going to do that." I mean, Diogenes is is a cynic, so he doesn't do a lot of things, and he says it's just as though a coin were asking somebody to recommend them in order to be tested. If the person in question is a tester of silver, you're going to recommend yourself. We ought to have in everyday life the sort of thing we have in the case of silver so that I may be able to say, as the assayer of silver does, bring me any drachma you please and I will appraise it. So again, here there's a correspondence between money and like our appearances or our reasonings or our character. Um, in uh, Book 3, Chapter 3, it says, just, it is the, just as it is the nature of every soul to ascend to the true, descent from the false, so you notice this, this theme again, right? Um, so it is its nature to be moved with desire towards the good, with aversion towards the evil, and to feel neutral towards what is neither evil nor good. Okay, so, so far so good, right? With a, what's going on in the intellect or reason is the same thing that happens in terms of our orientation towards the good and our choices. And then he says, just as neither the banker <clears throat> or the grocer may legally refuse the coinage of Caesar, but if you present it, whether he wants to or not, he must give you what you're purchasing with it, so it is with the soul. Different people have different pieces of coinage. A person offers the coin and gets what is bought by it. And he goes on uh, as well, and he says, so you know, we have to think about the, the, the purchases that we're making, the choices that we're making. He says, keep this thought ready at hand whenever you lose some external thing. What are you requiring in its place? If this is more valuable than the other, then don't say, I've suffered a loss. You've lost nothing. If you get a horse for an ass, an ox for a sheep, a noble action for a small piece of money. It's no small matter you're guarding, but self-respect, idos, fidelity, pistis, and constancy, a state of mind undisturbed by passion, pain, fear, or confusion, in a word, freedom. What are the things for which you were about to sell these things? Look how valuable they are. So, you know, we've almost got like price tags on things and we have to decide, we have to be savvy consumers. We have to be, you know, uh, good purchasers or exchangers. Um, in book one, chapter two, talking about the famous chamber pot thing, he says, hey, you know yourself, how much you're worth and at what price you sell yourself. People sell themselves for different prices. <clears throat> Consider the price you'll, you're willing to sell your pro racist uh, for. If you have to sell it, then at least don't sell it cheap. I mean, ideally, you don't sell it at all, but uh, get a good bargain if you're, if you're going to do that. Make sure that you get something that's going to make you happy. Um, and then in, um, I'll, I'll actually just skip to, to N. Caridian 25, um, he talks about paying prices for things, right? And he's talking about getting invited to dinner parties. Um, and we can think about all sorts of other opportunities that are offered to us and offered to other people. And he says, if you don't get invited to the dinner party, well, that's because, and I'm going to translate very crudely here, you didn't kiss enough butt. 
You know, if you want to get invited to parties, you got to sell yourself. You got to go around to the people that are having the parties and like, you know, say nice things to them and tell them things that are, you know, uh, false about themselves. And, and then they'll invite you. And, you know, if somebody else got invited, it's because they did the, the butt kissing that needed to be done. Um, you didn't do it. It's ridiculous for you to expect that you're going to get something without paying the price. And so he, he uses the example of an oval and a head of lettuce. He says, if you, uh, you know, don't want to buy the lettuce, don't buy the lettuce. But don't complain that you don't have the lettuce. If you've got the oval in your hand and you could sell it you know, or you could, you could purchase it, um, you know, you're the one who decides whether you exchange this or not. And so this, this entire metaphor, which there's many, many other passages where he, he talks about things in terms of prices and uh, purchasing and all that. We've all got these, these things that can appeal to us. And he talks about, you know, like some people, um, they're driven by lust, the price for them, beautiful bodies. Some people want honor, the price for them, getting, you know, fame and, and, and all of that. Some people just want money by itself. Some people want pleasure. These are all things that um, if we value them too much, if we value them to the extent that we're willing to sell ourselves out and do the wrong thing for them, um, we are going to give things power over us. We're going to be determined by them. And all of this is by reasoning processes, whether you know explicit or implicit, and they can be fixed by reasoning processes, but we have to choose to do so. Right. So if if I see my friend, as, I mean, you think about Epictetus as being like our friend and he just happens to be contained unlike a regular body in these uh, these books here. And we have to read our way through them and then we can start to apply those reasons within our life to, you know, be a little bit more clear about what we're doing, to prioritize better, to make better choices, to not sell ourselves out for things. Um, that's, that's a possibility for us. And so we give ourselves reasons. And I, and I think that, you know, Epictetus uses lots of metaphors and analogies. I think that's a great way to do it. You know, it brings home to us um, these very abstract ideas that otherwise might, might trip us up. Um, the idea of not selling ourselves out for something, I think that's quite valuable. Um, that everything has a certain kind of price, but that we get to decide whether we're willing to pay it or not, if we're being conscious of what we're doing, I think that can be quite quite helpful. There are a number of other um, uh, examples of like leading people through better practical reasoning, uh, some of which are in the handouts that, that I provided, like holding the chamber pot. You know, do you, do you hold the chamber pot or do you not do it? It, it? That's up to you. You know, Epictetus is saying if you're the kind of person who's willing to sell yourself out for that, then hold the chamber pot and don't feel bad about it. Just go ahead and do it. If you think that that's beneath you, well, then act a different way. He's got another great example about familial affection. There's this father who shows up and he's he's talking with him and he's like, how's married life going? And he's like, oh, it's uh, it's really rough. You know, my daughter got sick and I was so filled with familial affection that I had to like leave the room and I couldn't stay with her. And Epictetus is like, buddy, that's not familial affection. And it, there's a whole reasoning process that he leads them through that you can, you can check out there. Um, he, he's got another one in the handouts about leaving school due to illness where Epictetus's point is, hey, you can be sick anywhere, buddy. Um, why not be sick here at school rather than, than go home? Um, and there's another one that I'm really fond of where he, get, he has a conversation with a local official who's all ticked off because he went to the theater and he got into an argument with all the rest of the people in the audience about who should be awarded a prize. And they started shouting at him and he started shouting at them. And, you know, uh, he comes to Epictetus basically looking for some validation. And Epictetus tells him, you know, you're the example, you're the official, you're the person in charge. You should think through these things better. You know, if you want the audience to behave like decent people, how about you act like a decent person you know, when it comes to these, these sorts of things? Now, what's going on in all of these cases? Epictetus is applying the remedy of reason, providing reasons, plural, for how people ought to use their own proiresis uh, 
to change that priorasis to become a little bit better. I mean, what was his track record? I'll, I'll, I'll close with this and then let's do some more Q&A. Um, he tells us that Socrates was successful maybe in one case out of a thousand and that's like a good track record. So it's not as if these are like automatic on off switches. You just point out to somebody, oh, you screwed up. And then they they automatically are receptive to you. And they're like, thank you so much for helping me fix my, my damaged prior racist. <laughs> Instead, it's going to be a, a very uh, a tough ongoing process that may involve, you know, some arguing back and forth and conflict and they might abuse you or tell you you're wrong or stuff like that. But he thinks that it does work, you know, and that's a good portion of what he does in his teachings and what he does in his conversations with people that are preserved in the, the books that we have of the discourses, the uh, four books of the originally eight that his, his student Arian wrote down. So um, there's, I think there's a lot yet to that's probably murky about this, and I'm, I'm happy to um, do a, you know, sort of a general Q&A about any of this stuff. Um, but that's... that's uh, those are my thoughts on, on what Epictetus is doing. Um, you notice that most of it is just bringing up what Epictetus actually says in kind of a digested form. Um, I don't know. I don't know that what I'm saying here is particularly uh, new as far as interpretation of Epictetus, but I think it's it's worth thinking about. How how do we make sense of our own screwed up lives, and then um, make them better by by bringing in reasoning and other people's reasoning. You know, so I'm happy to entertain any questions or comments. That's that's a great question about habit and actions and choices and how we modify our our prioracis. And you could think of the prioracis. He doesn't actually say this as such, but it's, I think it's something that you could legitimately draw out of his his ideas. The prioracis is kind of a bundle of habits, among other things. And those habits are generated in, in kind of an Aristotelian way, right? By doing the same thing uh, in similar circumstances. And he says exactly that in, in a few parts of the, um, the discourses. He also gives us a lot of advice about if you want to break a habit, well, you've got to like push over to the other extreme. You know, he uses the metaphor of a ship, a ship that's kind of like tilted to the side. And if you want it to tilt over, you got to push it further over to the other side. So there, there's interestingly, although Epictetus, the, the only things he says about Aristotelians is that they're basically like not as bad as Epicureans, but pretty close. <laughs> He certainly uh, says a lot of things that sound pretty consonant with the Aristotelian conception of virtue ethics, right? Um, by doing the same thing over and over again, we, we generate habits. Um, we got to be really careful, too, once we've got a bad habit. Um, he, he talks, this, this may gross people out a little bit, but he talks about like with anger, um, the habit that you've generated is sort of like having scar tissue from being whipped. And then he says, if you're giving into it, once you know that you've already got a habit, that's sort of like, that goes beyond just wheels and becomes wounds in your, sort of like in your body, but imagine in, in your soul, right? It's more and more damaging as, as time goes on. I mean, coming close to what we nowadays call trauma, you know, which I think is a big challenge for, for virtue ethics. Um, so we, we have to be, yeah, we have to be quite cognizant of the habits that we have. And there's another really important feature of, of uh, what he has to say about habits. So at any moment when we're tempted to do something on the basis of a bad habit, of, uh, a vicious habit, um, we usually have a line of reasoning that goes like this. It, it will say, oh, it's not a big deal because I'm only doing it in this one instance, you know, um, Normally, I wouldn't have a midnight snack, but I just gave a good presentation, so I get to indulge myself, right? <laughs> you know? Or uh, normally, I wouldn't have lost my temper, but that person was a complete jackass, and, and they, they had it coming, right? And what we don't realize is that like at every moment, we have this little tiny bit of freedom to improve ourselves or to, to backslide. And 
abandoning this habit, this sort of meta habit of excusing ourselves when it comes to bad habits, that's an important part of moral improvement, right? Paying attention to each situation that we're getting ourselves in and, and not making excuses for ourselves as we're tempted to do, which, which is an affective thing, right? We already have a, a habit, uh, a tendency of making excuses. And there may be all sorts of other people giving us bad advice. Oh, it's, it's okay for you to do this, right? Um, so, so yeah, this, this dimension of habit is absolutely important for moral development, uh, for, for Epictetus. And I, I would say for the Stoics in general. I mean, how do you get to be a good person, a virtuous person, you know, you think about their their four cardinal virtues, um, wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. They're, they're not, sometimes they're portrayed as if like you either have one or you don't, and there's no in between. But I, I think that that's, that's certainly not there in Epictetus, and Seneca sometimes says stuff like that, but then he contradicts himself later on about the importance of changing things gradually. So... I see another question from Sonia. That's a great. That's a great question uh, about how we become aware of our own vices, right? How uh, things things that we need to fix about ourselves. Um, so sometimes, uh, you know, you asked, is it because of our the, the bad consequences? Yeah, sometimes it is. Like you know, I get angry and then I get fired from a job, or. Uh, Somebody doesn't fire me, but, but human resources sends me to mandatory uh, anger management classes. And now I'm aware that I have a, a problem that I need to work on. And actually, when I go into the anger management class, I'm probably resistant the way most people are in the first couple sessions. They're like, I, I, these, all these other people, they've got a problem, not me. You know? But you know, after a while, you, you come to see that, nah, you're, you're not that different than everybody else. So, so now we're already moving from consequences that you don't like to like seeing that you aren't that exceptional. Um, and, and, and Epictetus does talk about this. You know, you, you uh, complain. He says at one point, I don't remember exactly where this is. Oh, you're complaining about other people and their own screwed up behavior. But what about you, buddy? You know, are, aren't you like that yourself? Marcus also says that to himself as well. And then, you know, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier in a passage that I brought up. Contradictions or conflicts, mache. Um, most of us are, are not completely consistent, right? <laughs> Epictetus himself cops to that. Um, do we get bothered by our inconsistencies? So sometimes this could be outside people coming in and saying, you know, you criticize these people over here, but you yourself do this. Or I don't like when you behave this way. Um, you need to look at this, right? And sometimes it's ourselves um, realizing the contradictions that we've got ourselves in. We're like, holy crap, my life is a mess. Um, I need to start fixing this. But, you know, it, it, this is a, kind of an interesting side note. And, and this gets away from Epictetus into, you know, thinking about moral development more generally. Um you see that with a lot of people, and I can say this from my own experience, and also a lot of theorists throughout history, um, particularly the monastic writers, that the first problem that we identify usually isn't like the main problem. We, we, we see something and we're like, oh, this is messed up. I need to work on this. And then we start digging into it. And then we're like, ooh, there's even bigger things down below, you know, and it's, it's sort of like um, walking into somebody's house where you're going to like, you're supposed to like, I don't know, do a little bit of light carpentry to help them with their window. Actually, when I was a kid, we worked on a place like this. My, <clears throat> my uncle and I were supposed to paint a house. And as we're painting the house, we realized that there were like boards that were rotting because they're coming apart as we're painting it. And we're, and we're like, we're going to have to replace these boards. And then he actually taught me how to glaze windows because some of the windows had to be replaced. And it turned into this gigantic project, you know. Well, that's usually the way it works for us when we're engaged in moral development. You know, you get sent to anger management and you're like, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to learn how to be cool for a while. And then you're like, oh, I'm angry because everybody in my family yells at each other all the time. You know, I need to like work on this stuff. So maybe to go back to your, your original question, how are we motivated? 
to to improve ourselves, maybe the motivation can't happen all at once for most of us, you know, because we're more screwed up than we than we realize we are, you know. I mean, I know that's certainly the case for me. Um, I suspect that's probably the case for most people. It's not as if we can like do a scientific study of this, but. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, questions or things you want to talk more about? Or oh, okay, here we go. Um, from she, I heard there are different reasonings. It's up to you, depending on how you choose. But how does the remedy of reasoning come in? How knowing the other person's reasoning process can somehow change or correct mine? So there's a lot of ways. Um, I mean, there could be the mirroring thing that we were talking about. You see somebody else making uh, really foolish arguments and you're like, holy crap, I'm glad I'm not like those dummies over there. And then you realize, oh, wait a second, I am like those dummies over there. You know. And so seeing other people's bad reasonings could somehow provoke you to realize your own mistaken reasonings. Um, I mean, sometimes we, we um, start paying attention to our reasonings because somebody whose opinion we value tells us we need to stop screwing up like we're screwing up. And, uh, you know, this, this could be like, in my case, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that I have a, uh, a great wife who um, is very smart, smarter than me, um, quite perceptive, you know, and uh, is um, pretty willing to call me out on stuff, you know. Uh, but it could be a good friend. It could be a, a teacher or a mentor. It could be, you know, if you have, if you're lucky enough to get a good psychologist or life coach or somebody else who digs into these sorts of things, it, it might be that. So that's a second way, right? They they actually say you need to like start thinking about this. In the course of psychotherapy, people, depending on what kind of modality they're pursuing, they often like explore their own processes of reasoning and and try to look for. Um, different biases or uh, blank spots where they're missing something or mistaken lines of reasoning or stuff like that. Um, what else? I mean, Epictetus actually is a great model for this. Every point in his works where he says, have this ready at hand or um, in a situation like this, be ready to say to yourself, those are um, lines of reasoning that he's offering to us, right? I mean, th this is a bit of a digression, but so, you know, originally there were eight, eight books of the discourses, and we've lost um, four of those, uh, apparently. But that was just Arian studying with Epictetus for a space of like two to three years and then writing stuff down. Imagine if we had like video recordings and they were, of course, translated from ancient Koine Greek into to, uh, our languages, of Epictetus actually teaching. How many conversations he would have had? How many places where he would have said, when you're in a situation like this, try this out. When you're doing this, try this out. That's, that's um, I think, part of the effect of his, his own teaching. I mean, we have similar things with Seneca, right? Seneca writes these letters to Lucilius, and he writes some letters of consolation, and he writes some treatises, and he often says similar things where he's like, when you get into a situation like this, try to look at things this way, or try to think about these, these ideas. So those are those remedy of, of reasoning. Um, now, how effective are they? I mean, it depends on the person. Depends on their willingness to actually listen to it. Um, it's not as if you just throw the right reasoning in front of somebody and they accept the coinage and they're like, you know, a, um, a vending machine, right? Where you put in the, the money and uh, you push the button and then the soda or candy or chips comes out. Uh, but, you know, we're more complicated than that. And, and you can kind of work on people over a while. Gareth, it looks like you've got a a question as well. Um, so there, there's a couple interesting things there in your question. Um, let me try to 
split them apart from each other. And let, let's talk about the ship of Theseus thing first, right? So ship of Theseus, everyone's familiar with that, right? Theseus starts sailing. He's got to replace things along the way. At the end, every single piece of the ship has been replaced. Is it the same ship? Well, that's the way that the Stoics um, basically look at the human psyche. Um, you know, uh, if reason is just a system of appearances, then you can swap things out in and out all, all the time. It's, it's, I guess you could say it, it kind of matters like what kind of appearance they are maybe, you know. Um, and, and similarly with um, changing habits, what you're doing in, in the prioracis in, in modifying it by the choices that you're making is you're, you're swapping some bits out and swapping some other bits out, right? And there may be some that are like harder to move. Uh, like, you know, if you have some, we, I mentioned the word trauma a little bit earlier. I think that one of the big challenges for virtue ethics in general is taking adequate account of the traumas that by the time that we're adults, we're, we're stuck with and often prove much more intractable to modification or fixing than the other parts of ourselves. Um, <clears throat> but even those, you know, um, you can gradually replace those, those reactions and, um, you know, reframe memories and things like that. So I, I think that's, that, that's the ship of Theseus thing is quite interesting. As far as the indifference, um, so there's two things to say. One is, one is in direct response to your question, are there actions that are indifferent? Yeah, and the Stoics actually give examples of them. Like, you know, is your finger bent or is it straight, right? Straightening your finger, bending your finger, who cares? It doesn't, doesn't matter. <laughs> Now, if, if, if I'm like, you know, if I take my glasses off and I, my finger is bent and then it's straight and I poke myself in the eye, suddenly it assumes some importance, right? And so there could be a lot of things that I guess you could say in themselves are in different actions, but when we put them into a framework or <laughs> prime example, giving somebody the middle finger, right? Maybe you're just counting, you know, uh, but it could also turn into a gesture that's, you know, showing defiance. I, when I was a kid, I actually had this finger crushed in a door and I didn't know what the middle finger meant. And so the older kids were all like, hey, show us that injured finger, you know, and then I'm like, here it is, you know, and then I got in trouble with the, the teachers. It was like in third grade or so. Um, so some things that, that, in themselves are indifferent within certain contexts could have could have value, right? And you know, if you think about what we count as money, um, now that's not about actions, but that's more about other stuff. You know, I grew up um, in a time when cash was important and people would write checks and then credit cards were a rarity. And now there's a lot of places where you can't even use cash, you know? Um, and, and, you know, there's all sorts of other things that we never dreamed of, like Apple Pay or Google Pay or things like that. What counts as money is, is you know, is kind of an indifferent in itself. But when you want to buy a hamburger, it's no longer quite so indifferent to you. <laughs> it doesn't have the value that makes you virtuous or vicious, but it's important. The, the third thing to say about the indifference is the Stoics don't think that we should be indifferent to all of the indifference, that um, using them well or dealing with them well is, in fact, as, as, as Epictetus says, um, something could be indifferent, but our use of it is not indifferent, and it is within our control, and it is a matter of the prioracis. So how I use my money, money itself is an indifferent, but how I use my money is not. I can use it virtuously or viciously, you know. Um, and there's all sorts of other things like that as, as, as well within that, that realm. And you can say that about bad things too, like how do I use my sickness? Um, I'm still suffering from some effects of long COVID. Do I use it uh, um, rather cynically as an excuse to get out of doing work? <laughs> right? That's vicious. Do I need to like pay attention to certain things so I don't overexert myself and then wind up being too tired to fulfill my obligations, okay, that's more of a virtuous uh, way of, of dealing with and indifferent of, of the body and illness and stuff like that. Uh, I see another question from Sonia, though. So, yeah, so the, the, you're asking about um, what the Stoics would call um, virtuous or vicious actions and then appropriate or inappropriate actions or duties and, and what's contrary to duty. 
And I mean, the Stoics thought they have a very robust developed virtue ethics and like there's these four cardinal virtues and each of the virtues has like subdivisions and so you you can say that there are some things that are the right thing to do um, within you know like almost all circumstances um, take for example Seneca in on anger he says um, do you need to get angry in order to prevent your father from being murdered you know and he says no you you don't you can do that being motivated by courage or just by right practical reasoning uh, because you should keep your father from being murdered and then he can say well yeah but what if your father's Hitler you know or some other horrible but what if your father's Nero <laughs> You know, somebody who, who as we, there's some movie where somebody's like, that, that's a person who needs killing, you know? Okay, well, that's a little bit different. But in, in most circumstances, it's pretty easy to identify protecting life as, as the right thing to do, right? As a just thing to do, a courageous thing to do. Um, there are going to be some tricky cases. Um, and then, you know, we want to use prudence as much as we can. Prudence, the Stoics define as like the capacity or the knowledge uh, of what is what is good for us, what is bad for us, being able to like work through processes of weighing these things and, and all of that. So we might need some adjuncts. It's not just like, you know, responding immediately in the circumstances. Um, but I, I think that, you know, that's where we, we look at the other things that they, they have to say. Um, not that they're going to provide us with perfect guidance about every single circumstance. They also do think the motivation matters. You know, if you're doing something that would generally be seen as a virtuous action, but you're doing it motivated because you want to have everybody look at you and say, wow, what a, what a great person, you know, as we call it over here, being a big shot, you know, um, that, that changes the action. It's 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 virtuous and it's good in some respects, but it's bad in other respects. But I mean, Aristotle says that too, you know, and Plato says that too, you know. Plato in the Phaedo distinguishes um, what most people think of as courage from philosophical courage, you know, like um, you you run into the burning building because you're afraid of looking like you're scared of the fire. That's not courage, according to Plato. You're, you're just transferring one fear to another, you know. Uh, so I think this is kind of a common thing in, in virtue ethics. There's like Aristotle has this this great discussion of acting from virtue, right? Because you've actually got the virtue, and then just acting in accordance with virtue, um, being self-controlled. And he says, yeah, they're both good. One's one's way better than the other, you know. Um, and we could say similar things with vicious behavior. Then the Stoics will define this primarily in terms of, I mean, here's, here's one place where I totally disagree with the Stoics. They've got this whole notion of the sage, like the perfect person, and only the perfect person can do perfectly good actions. Um, they call those um, kat orthomata as opposed to kathekon, kathekonta. And the kathekonta is often translated as like actions in accordance with duty or um, appropriate actions. They're like the right thing to do, but they don't have like a perfect motivation behind them. Whereas the sage, this legendary person who we don't even know if they ever existed, um, and Epictetus says, I'm not a sage, by the way. Um, they, With them, like the motivational structure is completely perfect. I, I think this is kind of it's not a very helpful thing. It often discourages people <laughs> because they're like, I can never be completely good, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, we could probably set that aside, the, the, the sage conception. I mean, if Epictetus thought anybody was a sage, it was Socrates, Diogenes, and Zeno. And when you look at all three of them, and the stories that we have about them, they don't seem perfect people. I mean, Socrates, sure, he was a great philosopher, but he was also a terrible father, you know. Um, Diogenes seems more like a jerk than a perfect herald of God, as the cynics like to call themselves all the time. And Zeno actually was afraid to carry a pot of lentils across the marketplace. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, they, they all had flaws, but each of them had their, their roles, as Epictetus says, you know, each of them did their, their work. 
Uh, and I think that's the best we can probably aim for, you know. I'll say one other thing too in response to your question. Um, we probably need other people to be involved with us to call us out on our BS when we think that we're doing like perfectly good stuff and we're being we've, we've like advanced and we're you know at the pinnacle of goodness. Uh, we probably need other people in the background to say, oh no no you're not you're not quite so good. You still have some work to do on yourself, you know. So she says, I want to ask about coherence. I think that was mentioned at the very beginning in the title. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't have coherence in the title. Character is the, the C word in the title. But uh, you can say that, that for the Stoics, and again, not uniquely, right? Um, coherence, our ideas and our actions and our character being coherent as opposed to being contradictory or in conflict with the, each other, um, that's, that's really important. Um, and, and I think that's, that's a place where you could say that, that virtue ethics intersects with, with psychotherapy and with, with other things as well because you know we do want to be generally coherent in the things that we desire and commit to and, and prioritize and choose to do. Um, and we, you know, we want that coherence to be, you could say, one that's oriented towards the good, because I suppose you could be more or less coherently evil, you know, in some respects. I mean, you would be incoherent on other levels for the Stoics, but um, there are some examples of people who seem to be, you know, uh, very well developed in 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 doing evil. So, you know, coherence, yeah, that that's that's. Um, so that's something that Epictetus talks about with just a single term, but you could say that that is something in the background for um, Stoic ethics in general, um, the whole idea of living in accordance. You know, um, in accordance is translating several different Greek terms, one of which is um, uh, harmonia, right, which is, is definitely like concordance or or coherence. So, so yeah, I think that's 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 a, a good thing to highlight. Um, well, again, thanks so much for for having me here, and I very much enjoyed spending this time with you. And uh, yeah, hope I hope the handouts are, are helpful for you, and uh, I'll maybe see some of you again in the ether, and uh, maybe someday I'll be there in Würzburg. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>